Hi guys. So, I was just listening to a very interesting talk between Sargon of Akkad and Jason Unruh, and it was on the topic of communism. Now, Jason Unruh says he's a Maoist, Leninist, Marxist, communist, although I, he also says that he's actually not a Maoist anymore, but they talk quite a bit about Maoist, um, well, Maoist ideas, really. And... I just wanted to critique one or two things that they said. In fact, I've got a list of about 12 things here that I just wanted to run... 14, actually. I just wanted to run through the list, basically, and just make a few corrections, just um, because I thought it was quite interesting and I thought it was a really good debate, but there were quite a few points of contention and I think I can answer a lot of these and provide a bit more clarity. So the first question I really wanted to address was about income inequality and is this actually bad sargon essentially said if the poor are still rich income inequality doesn't really matter and basically what matters is just raising the living standards of the poor up to a point that they're not really suffering um whereas if you actually look at the data and i'm looking at some here the evidence from a range of studies suggests that there is indeed a correlation between income inequality uh, health and social problems however further research is needed of course we always say that but it also says interesting interestingly within a particular society those with a higher income those with higher incomes do better on on a range of outcomes um there is therefore a social gradient in health which means that every step up a socio-economic ladder leads to an increase in health now, this is really interesting because this isn't just about behaviour, but actual physical health. What you quite often find is people higher up the hierarchy tend to be healthier. And this isn't just a result of their um, income. This is a result of how they see themselves. Uh, we've got an inbuilt system based on dopamine that kind of ranks us within a society. And, you know, this is common to pretty much all mammals, not just humans. So... Um, this also kind of feeds into the question of class because I think we'll always have class because it's just w built within every single human and animal society pretty much I mean whether you're talking about humans or a pack of wolves or it, it can be any animal I mean for goodness sake even guinea pigs you know they have a social hierarchy chickens they have a pecking order so yeah I do think that there is some kind of class uh, difference in status let's say innate within the human race so anyway, yes, inequality is bad. So I said dopamine, but what I really mean is serotonin. So the second point here, is the world actually richer? Has the world got richer over time? Now, if you're working class and you're in the West, so uh, Europe and America mostly, but I suppose other countries are sort of included, the answer is no. What's happened is the cost of some goods has come down because a lot of other countries around the world have actually started producing higher quality goods at a lower price. So, for example, you can go out and you can spend £300 on a really nice flat screen television, but a lot of that has to do with increases in technology. But if you're looking at the world as a whole, then absolutely yes, everyone pretty much has benefited in some way from capitalism. Uh, absolute poverty in China, for example, has gone down from around about 90% in, say, 1970, around about to a less than 5% today. And now that's absolute poverty. That's different from relative poverty. But nevertheless, the whole world has got richer. And if you actually look at the data, which I do invite you to do, um, you'll sort of see this is the case. So the next point of contention is that universal basic income would actually increase inflation and it would therefore not benefit anybody. Now this is actually a very common idea, especially in the Americas, and it just isn't true. And the reason for that is, well there's two reasons for that. Firstly, we know that most of the money is in the hands of a tiny minority of people, and this is absolutely true. Now you always hear about the bottom 60% having less money than the top 10%. Um, you know, that's very true. Actually, income inequality is... Relative income inequality is increasing. So, 
what would happen if you introduced a high level of universal basic income to everyone is that wouldn't increase the cost of goods coming from China and Asia and the rest of the world. So more of them would be consumed. This would actually be good for growth. The relative wealth of richer people might go down slightly, but it would not go down enough to really uh, affect inflation. And we're talking about relative wealth, uh, looking at the poorest and the richest. So the rich would still have most of the money. The rest of the world would still want to sell goods. It would just be basically the people on a low and medium income that would actually feel the benefit of such a system. And with unemployment looking like it's going to increase significantly, well, universal basic income is looking like a better and better idea all the time. So no, basically. No, universal basic income would not be wiped out by inflation because, quite frankly, ordinary people don't have that much money. I mean, they just don't relative to the super rich. So I hope that addresses that question. So when I said relative wealth, I actually meant relative inequality. Let's talk about inflation because there was a point of contention here Jason was arguing if the cost of goods goes up, that's inflation. Whereas Sargon was arguing that it is about the money more than the goods. So just to clarify, when the value of money goes down, that means the relative cost of goods goes up. This is what we call inflation. Inflation is the amount by which the money has devalued itself or has been devalued. So that's essentially the inflation. I just wanted to clarify that because I know the previous answer was a bit confusing. And you can measure money in two ways. The price of money relative to other currencies or the worth of money related to goods. So yes, inflation is more to do with money than it is to do with goods, but we use the price of goods to measure inflation. So I hope that clears that up. So here's the interesting thing. Jason was actually arguing that if you're living on a dollar a day or two dollars a day, then that still means the cost of a loaf of bread is two dollars. So you can basically afford two dollars worth of bread or that will be a loaf of bread. Now, this isn't actually true. Sargon was absolutely correct here. I had a friend who went to China a while ago and she went to Beijing and she found out that everything was about maybe two thirds cheaper than here, well, the UK. But then she went to rural China where they do live on um, a much smaller income and she went to a local bar and she found for about two American cents or virtually nothing, she could buy a pint of beer. So basically, I think how it works is, let's say you wanna buy like a brand name product like Adidas sneakers or something. You would, if you wanted to buy from new, you would probably have to pay a similar sort of price to what we would pay in the UK. But if you want to buy local produce, then yes, it is a lot cheaper. So maybe you can't have the latest sneakers, but you can still have a pint of beer for two cents. So, you know, uh, swings and roundabouts. Anyway, Sargon was correct on that point. The next point is really just a definition. I just wanted to make a distinction between relative poverty and absolute poverty. Absolute poverty is defined as living below either a dollar a day or one dollar twenty five a day. And um, that's American dollars. And that is kind of relative spending power. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Relative poverty is the richest people and the poorest people and you could say maybe the poorest 10 percent of a population are in poverty now this is different from absolute poverty which is basically having very little or nothing so yeah that's an important distinction to make the next one's nice and easy to refute the ussr was as rich as the usa when it collapsed and the uh, answer to that is no there we go. It was not as rich as the USA. In fact, the USA was probably really in a golden age when the USSR collapsed. You know, the USA was doing incredibly well. Um, I've heard the statistic that uh, the USSR was uh, so in it had twice as many resources as the USA. 
so in terms of physical resources. Nevertheless, it turned out to be a much worse system, and I'm going to go into that later on, because I think why communism failed is really, really important, and it's also very simple, so stay tuned for that. So, the power of culture. Culture is incredibly important, and Sargon kind of talks about this, but Jason doesn't really seem very receptive to the idea. He's more into the idea that money and economics are the only thing that matters within a country, so sorting them out is paramount. But actually, culture is incredibly important. Now, I'm going to draw a distinction here between the UK and China, and I'm talking about the past here. China has been probably one of the most powerful countries, and it has had, roughly speaking, well, it's, it's had continuous power for 9,000 years. More than any other culture on Earth, China has kind of sustained itself for all that time, and yet it wasn't imperial. You know, China basically wasn't interested in the rest of the world. The Chinese just wanted to control their domain. Internal politics were quite complicated, but the Chinese considered themselves to be civilization and sort of anybody outside of China to be sort of the, I wouldn't say enemy, but just other people. And if you look at Britain, yes, there were... What I'm basically saying is Britain had an empire that spanned two-thirds of the world, roughly speaking. You know, uh, this wasn't just technology. This was culture. Because our culture said, hey, we can do this. It'll be good to build the empire. So if China had wanted an empire, it could have easily had an empire as big as the British Empire, if not bigger, if it wanted that. But it didn't want that because it had a different culture. Now, this, I just think, is an interesting point, because culture is really important. And I'm not just talking about imperialism here. Culture is so important for even the basics in life. So, for, for example, the whole point of money is that we believe it has value, but money doesn't actually have any intrinsic value. It is the cultural belief that money has value that gives it value. In the same way, we have a sort of belief that art has value. It doesn't have intrinsic value. I mean, it like might look pretty on the wall, but there, no, there is no way that any painting on earth could sell for a million pounds unless you believed in a sort of cultural construct that this painting is actually worth that, which we do. Uh, nevertheless, culture is important. That's the point I'm trying to make. And that's the point Sargon was trying to make when he referenced um, Sparta. The next question is about wars. Are all wars economic? Simple answer, no. A lot of them are related to economics, but the reasons why people have wars are very complicated, and to simply say it's about money and resources, that's not true. It's not even all about geopolitics either. As Sargon said, sometimes you go to war about honour. If you look at the First World War, I think it was um, Francis Ferdinand who was shot. Again, my history isn't very strong, but Francis Ferdinand was shot and that really sparked the First World War. I think he was shot in Austria. Um, nevertheless, it was kind of a war about honour. And yes, you could probably say that the countries wanted to go to war anyway to test their armies, but simple answer is a lot of wars are way more complicated just for money. So... That answers that. Is the state just about economics? Short answer, no. There's an awful lot going on in every nation. It isn't just about economics. If it were just about economics, I don't think the world would be such a kind and caring place. Because if you actually look at graduates who have studied economics, you find they become less beneficent beneficent, you find they become less charitable, you know, they give less to charity, they kind of squirrel money away more, and I kind of think we're not actually a very economic world. I think the people who care about economics and who dominate economically are very powerful and influential, but 
no, there's a lot more to human beings than just economics. There is kindness and caring and compassion and there's so many other cultural constructs out there. It, just saying a cult country is about economics, absolutely not. To give an example, if you look at Germany, they've taken in a lot of migrants recently and I've actually heard some German officials saying that it brought tears to their eyes because they were so emotional um, when they sort of see the migrants coming to their country and it kind of made them feel really good as a nation even though they're going to pay out I think it was roughly 20 billion uh, by 2020 on the migrants who have arrived in Germany um, this doesn't make much economic sense you could kind of argue that they're going to be good workers but I hear the illiteracy rates are quite high I hear that Turkey is sending a lot of illiterate people to Germany and Western Europe and, you know, they're just being welcomed in, basically. And I know Germany might have changed its ideas recently, but the point is, if we were more economically driven, then no, we wouldn't be so compassionate. We wouldn't have so many other sort of cultural quirks. We wouldn't care so much about democracy and freedom of speech and other things like that. We'd be more concerned about maximising productivity and you know, getting more money into the country. So, basically, we're quite complicated as a species. So, just to say the state is about economics, no. And just to clarify, um, the German government plans to spend 93.6 billion euros on refugees by the end of 2020, according to Spiegel. So, just wanted to put that clarification in there. It's quite a lot of money, obviously, Germans want to do that and of course it's their country so of course they're more than welcome to obviously poor people don't hold revolutions now this wasn't expressly said in the video but it is true what generally happens is the middle class will gain power and the middle class will overthrow the ruling class even in Marxist theory it doesn't necessarily say that the working class will overthrow the upper class on their own there is always a sort of middle class um to help the revolution now historically a lot of poor people really don't have time to plot about plot throwing over the government you know they're working hard just to maintain their you know income to feed their family if they have a family they basically don't have the time or energy to overthrow or even the ability to overthrow a government and this is really and the reason why is because if you want to overthrow the government, what you need to do is you need to get the keys of power on your side. And the only way to do that is to really be within the middle classes and to promise the keys of power something that they're going to benefit from. So if we're, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but let's say we're in an oil rich country, now the keys to power might be the leader of the military, might be the oil interests, it might be many other groups, and if you want to take over, what you need to do is you need to say to these interests, hey, I'm going to give you more money, more resources, better laws, etc, and they might risk overthrowing the government if the government is, for example, spending too much money on schools and welfare. They might overthrow the government and install a dictatorship. Now, this is generally what happens a lot of the time. And this is why a lot of poor countries end up with terrible leaders. Um, this is why we get dictators ruling relatively poor countries that are mineral rich. Because the keys to power um, are the ones benefiting really from that dictatorial relationship you know they don't want the money being spent on the people they want the money themselves i mean after all they've got their um military to upkeep or they've got their you know research and development costs and investing in infrastructure and all of that so yeah poor people don't generally start revolutions if china or india cut off the United States, the United States would fall within a month. Now, this was the claim that Jason put forward, and he kind of said that we could use this as leverage to make the USA adopt socialism or communism. He didn't really specify, but he basically said that this is something that could happen. Basically, no. If China, for example, 
cut off the United States, for a start, it would affect China very, very badly. It would affect the United States very badly. But the United States would very quickly go to other markets and it would say, hey, you know, there's a massive hole in our market here. You know, we've got a demand for all these goods and services. Can you fill it? And they would say, yes, of course, we can fill that massive hole. So it would actually not hurt the United States as much as it would hurt China, because China would actually lose their almost monopoly on exports um, of certain types of goods. So no, the whole point of a free market is you can just buy from somebody else. So no, China or India can't overthrow the United States in the way Jason described. My next question is nice and simple. Is the world warming? And the answer is yes. I'm looking at a graph here that says in 1880, global average temperature in Fahrenheit was 57 degrees. Now, if we go to 2008, it looks like um, that temperature is up to 58.5. So um, and remember, that's Fahrenheit. And this is for global average temperature, the average temperature across the planet. So, yes the world is actually warming up. This is what all the evidence says. This isn't some theoretical thing that's going to happen in the future. The world is actually warming. The seas are actually rising. And yes, weather events are getting more extreme. This isn't some crazy thing in the future. This is actually happening. And yes, it's going to get worse because this isn't going to level off. This is just going to get more and more extreme over time. The permafrost is going to melt. You know, there's a whole sort of cascade effect where it is going to get worse and worse and worse. So, yeah, long story short, yes, the world is getting warmer. Yes, it's going to continue to get warmer. And that sucks if you're a human being because we don't like the warmth. We don't like warmth. You know, in warm countries, there are a lot more disease and parasites. And there's all, you know, we don't like tornadoes or weather events or monsoons and when you put a lot more energy into the globe because there's more energy being stored in the globe i'm talking about energy from the sun here then yeah you're gonna get worse weather events it's bad basically but yeah that's what the data shows capitalism or rather capitalists aren't a class they're individual people now this is a very important point because when you think about the world in collectivist Marxist um, ways, you can think about all the working class as being one class and all the capitalist class being another kind of class. And you would think that they have all the same ideas, all the capitalist class want to stay in power and they want to remain powerful. And this isn't actually the case. We're talking about people here and people have different ideas and different beliefs and yes, you could kind of put them into a class, but they don't put themselves into a class. For example, you might have two rich capitalists who have completely different ideas about climate change, for example, that, that, that just came to mind. But yeah, there isn't a sort of class consciousness, really. That's what communists want. They want a class consciousness. But no, there isn't one. I don't think we should have one. I definitely don't think we should have racial consciousness. I think we would be far better off trying to get rid of racial ideas and just treating everybody as individuals. But no, that doesn't seem to be the current trend. So no, there might technically be a sort of rich capitalist class, but no, they're not. They don't all want the same thing, basically. So there's a theory that economists have that people act in a way that's self-interested. But actually, people don't act in a self-interested way. Now, this becomes very obvious if you meet some normal human beings, right? They smoke and they drink and they take drugs. Some rich people even think that they should pay more tax to help poorer people. Now, this isn't necessarily because they're thinking about their own selfish well-being. This is because they kind of aren't two-dimensional creatures. You know, they're fully autonomous people who have different ideas about the world. Um, so to say that people just automatically always act in their own economic interest 
is just simply not true. Ah, so we've almost made it through the list. Congratulations for sticking around this long. Lastly, I want to talk about the idea of the... Um, Jason talked about the French Commune and the fact that people took it in turns to be police. Now, the problem with this, more generally, is when you specialise in an area, you become very good at an area. So, in terms of a company, a company might make shoes. But if a company did, say, if a small company did 100 different things, it would generally do them quite poorly. When an individual or a company specialises in one area, they can become very, very, very good at that area. And this includes policing. So, police have a lot of experience with dealing with people who have a lot of problems, for example, and they have skills and expertise that most people don't have. Okay, they have to be physically fit, they have to be able to de-escalate situations. Well, at least in the UK, they have to be able to de-escalate situations. In the UK, you have to have all these skills, and it isn't just police, it's the same with everything. You could say, why don't we all become farmers and we can spend two hours a day farming. And this is a nice little communist idea that everyone can do everything. The truth is, you could, but you wouldn't be as productive as someone who is a full-time farmer, who has dedicated their lives to understanding it, who has the money and the technology to actually really maximise their crop yields and to really make good use of their lands. The point is, specialism actually produces better stuff and one of the problems with communism is they kind of think that you could be a fisherman in the morning and a brain surgeon in the afternoon now that might be a nice lifestyle choice but you're probably not going to get very good brain surgeons because that's a very difficult job requires a lot of investment into a person and to be honest you're not really using the brain surgeon to their full capacity you know if they are a brain surgeon full time they are far more useful to society than if they go out fishing for half their time to catch fish you kind of see the point here i mean would you really want a part-time aeroplane pilot who i don't know maybe he goes go-kart racing in his spare time or something um Oh, it wouldn't even be spare time. It would be go-kart racing to entertain people um, as half of his job. You can very quickly see that competency and specialisation are good, generally speaking. And that kind of refutes that point. Now, thanks for listening, guys. I think I've earned myself a nice cup of coffee. And as promised, I want to tell you why I feel the USSR, why Russia failed to actually... Well, why communism, socialism failed, and I realised it was more socialism, but yeah, they were trying for communism. And it failed because of the leadership. Now, I heard of a case where there was a factory, I think it was in Maoist China, actually, and they had red paint, but the state said they had to use green paint. Now, they had to close the factory for two weeks and wait for the delivery of paint. Uh, because the guy running the factory didn't have the freedom to basically use his initiative and to go in his own direction. He had to basically follow orders, you know. So there wasn't the same level of leadership you get in a free society like ours. In a free society, the CEO is basically able to do whatever they want to do as long as it's sort of supported by the board and as long as they're sort of broadly speaking, general support. Whereas if you're more less of a CEO and more of a general manager, you don't have the same freedom to do that, and that becomes a massive problem. So if you look at two systems, the amount of leadership you get in a free society is massively bigger than in a sort of centralised, state-run, communist, socialist-type system. So... Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Really hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe for more. And uh, if you didn't like this, leave a thumbs down. But if you did enjoy this, give this a big old thumbs up. And uh, thank you very much. And I hope to hear from you in the comments. Subscribe for more. I know I already said that. Thank you very much. And goodbye.